if you can sing in the choir, let's come on up here and help us out tonight, okay? Good evening and welcome to Tabernacle Baptist Church. It's good to see everyone here tonight. And I hope you came with your heart prepared to serve and to worship the Lord tonight. Let's all stand and we'll turn to page 381 in the old church hymnal. The small book, 381, stand up, stand up for Jesus, okay? Let's sing all three stanzas. page 97 and we'll sing Jesus saves aren't you glad that he still is able to save sing it out we have heard
before we sing the last verse, I would ask Brother Spanico if he'd come forward and lead us in prayer right after the last verse, okay? Let's sing it out. Give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus save, Jesus save. pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, how we thank you that we have the knowledge and insurance of salvation tonight. There is no greater gift. Nothing on this earth could buy what Christ did for us on that cross of Calvary. How that blood was shed and it covers our sins. It takes them away. I'm so glad tonight that I know that I serve a God who is rich in mercy, a holy God, creator of heaven and earth, yet your word tells us delights in mercy. And Father, may tonight our hearts bleed for the lost as we look around us as a world that is turned upside down. May we have a compassion for Greenville, for Pickens, for all those, Father, that are within our reach to give them that blessed assurance of salvation found only in Christ. So I'm praying tonight that we might come before you, broken, contrite, knowing our need of a savior, knowing our need of your mercy, of your touch, that the Holy Spirit that it lives within each one of us would rise up, that we might cry out to you tonight. Help us, I pray. And I thank you. I thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight, in your place with your people. So be with us. Give us wisdom. May we not faint, but we may, may we continue in the battle to fight for those lost souls. Help us, Father, I pray. And I, again, I am reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice on Calvary's cross, the free gift of salvation found only in him. So I thank you, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Thank you so much for singing with us already. Appreciate that, Brother Spanical. The choir will be singing Kneel at the Cross, page 165 in the Old Church Hymnal. You pray for the choir as we sing tonight, okay?
Let's all stand and have a time of fellowship as the choir comes down. Make sure you greet our guest tonight, okay? Now, they're playing a song. I want, you, I want you to take that hymn book, turn to page 71, and I want you to, we're going to sing that third verse. I, if, I know you just sat down, but I'd love you to stand back up if you would. Page 71, kind of hard to sing about um, leaving this world and going to heaven. That's exactly what that third verse is about. It's about going to heaven one day. And uh, one day the praying is going to be ending. One day we're going to have our last prayer meeting down here. One day will be the last time you'll ever say, Lord, would you please, you won't ever, that'll never happen again. He'll be right there. But on that third verse, let's, uh, let's sing Sweet Hour of Prayer, and uh, you folks just watch me. I might just drop out at some point, okay? All right, we'll start off all together. You ready on that third verse, page 71? Now, think about what you're singing. Sing with your heart. Here we go. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour. Verse 2 of that right there, 181. <clears throat> if I were Brother Stevens, I would just hold up three fingers, step back, and they would know what to do. Can't do that. <clears throat> but we can't sing this. All right, blessed assurance. If you say, sing on the first verse. Blessed assurance, Jesus is It's your last chance. Now sing with me. Here we go. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting. Looking above. Filled with His goodness. Lost in His love. 
it then. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all I live long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. have a Savior that is worthy of our praise. I read in Psalm 113, and I'm not going to even look that way or I'll get to preaching, and it just says that our Lord, that the Lord, the Lord is worthy of our praise, and it gives several reasons why. And uh, one thing it talks about is just how unique he is. Don't we have a unique Savior? We have a Savior who was God, who came down and took on the form of a man, never sinned, and then went to a cross, paid for our sin, was buried, raised himself on the third day, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make an intercession for us. I'd say that's a unique Savior right there, amen. I mean, he, he made all things, yet he slept in the boat. He's the one that made all the herbs of the, of the ground, all the, all the cattle, all the, all the things in there that you could eat, and yet the Bible says that he hungered. And I, I, just a remarkable say, he's worthy of our praise. Somebody so holy that would touch somebody so dirty. I'm just amazed at that. Amen. I'm certainly glad that he did. Well, all right, you can be seated. Thank you. And uh, appreciate you, uh, appreciate you singing tonight. Appreciate Brother Rose and he's filling in and uh, we have the knowledge away and Abby and others trying to fill in different places. Appreciate that. And tonight, tonight, how many of you, how many of you can hear me really well? Would you raise your hand? Well, right before service had had a problem with our sound system, so James Simpson ran back and got a piece of equipment, replaced another piece of equipment so that you would be able to hear what you're hearing tonight. How many of you appreciate that? You say, why did you say that? Well, he got here early enough that he made a difference, and uh, had he not done that, then people after service would have been going out saying, well, I couldn't hear the preacher. I couldn't hear what he was saying, couldn't hear the singing. James, appreciate the work back there. Look, he's smiling from ear to ear right now. I tell you what, we won't, we won't have to pay him this week. Roger's happy he is right now. Amen. <laughs> um, several things to announce, and uh, since we have so many children next door, uh, probably should have announced these a little bit earlier, but a fall festival at the Parker's house um, at 5 o'clock this coming Saturday. And uh, the children will be there. If, if uh, you need information about that, see Ben or Sharon. I'm sure they'll let you know. I think Abby was also on the list and uh, somebody else I'm not recalling right now. And then also this Saturday evening, 5.30, there'll be a jubilee at Galilee Baptist Church. And uh, starts at 5.30 in the evening. And, uh, and if you want to be there for that, uh, they'll have preachers from the floor, young preachers and all that. I think we've had uh, participated in that. I think before it's been at Gethsemane, if I'm not mistaken. And this year it's at Galilee, and part of the reason is 45 years Brother Gravely's been in the ministry, and uh, they want to try to take and do something special for him. And then uh, this coming Sunday we'll have a fellowship right here at the church. I believe I'm correct about that. Is that right? And we're going to have all kind of food to eat and have a good time of fellowship. Looking forward to that. And then on the 29th, the 29th now, I, I want you to pray about it, 29th, and uh, we've, already, we've already put in a, uh, what, what I committed to give as far as our family $1,000 for the steeple, but if I can find a little more money come the 29th, I'm going to put some more money in. Maybe I can steal some from my son, Daniel. He doesn't need it anyway, and uh, so maybe I can find some in the floor somewhere, maybe just lying around accidentally somewhere. Um, maybe we ought to charge a little rent. I think this month might be rent month. Amen. <laughs> Found some money already. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we want to try to pay for that thing outright. And uh, I'll have a number for you this Sunday on how close we are. Um, just try to make the place look as good on the outside as it does on the inside with our good people. And then uh, on the 4th, or rather the 30th, we'll have Children's Home. And uh, they'll be going down to Silver Bay. If you'd like to pay for one of those uh, meals for the children, one of the workers, see Brother Benny James. If you'd like to come eat with us, we'd be glad to have you along. And I know that uh, I know they would appreciate that. They'd enjoy that. It's good to have the children's home here tonight. But boy, they came in and then they're gone. And uh, still, though, I know Abby and Hannah and got a few here. 
Mike, got a few workers here. I don't know, but uh, glad that they're here this evening. Um, also, uh, have the possibility of being involved in a good news club uh, at Welcome Elementary. And, um, you know, they had about, they, they, I was told they had as many as 150 kids that would meet in this club, but they have nobody to run that. So they kind of shut it down. And uh, one of the ladies in our church reached out and found out about it. And uh, it would take some training, um, you know, and it would take some time each week. But uh, if, you would, if you're interested in that, I believe there's a, some sheets right over there on that table. Um, and I think it's got a little school bus or something on that. If you'd take one of those and uh, just uh, fill that out, get it back to us, we would appreciate it. Um, also, if you take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 9 tonight. No, you know what? We need to have the offering. Sorry. Okay, gentlemen, if you'll come, we'll receive the offering. You can still turn to Genesis 9. That'll be next. <clears throat> and um, give you an opportunity to give the missions and uh, our guests that are here tonight. How many of you are glad we have guests here tonight? We say amen. amen. Well, we have several guests tonight. Not going to name them all. Um, some of them may go to other churches and their preacher might get mad at them being here, so I won't say anything about that, at least not tonight. So we're, but we're glad that you're here and uh, glad you, you're a guest at Tabernacle Baptist Church in a good church tonight. And um, I believe the Lord will meet with you. He'll give you what you need. And uh, you give tonight. Lord, bless this offering. Help us now as we continue to give to missions. Lord, new year, new commitment to give. I pray you'd help us not to give less. I pray you'd help us give more. And then I pray you'd help us not just to give. But you'd help us to go, as we've already heard prayed tonight, about the lost in Greenville. And, Lord, I know praying about the lost is not going to reach the lost. Talking about the lost is not going to reach them. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be willing to love our neighbor enough to go talk to them and tell them about Jesus Christ and let them know that there is a salvation that can keep them from hell and it can change their life if they just give you that opportunity. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, things that allure my sights. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, friends may beset me, still I will enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, 
will walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. All right. Thank you, Brother Ward. Um, I'm going to have Brother, Brother Rose come here, Brother Terrell, in just a minute. He's going to look at the back of our uh, bulletin as far as our missionaries. Very, a couple of things very interesting on there. But I need to make, make just a few notes before he does that. And if you look at Genesis 9 for just a minute, turn to Genesis uh, chapter number 9. Um, but Buzzy Robertson has surgery on the 25th, so if you'd, uh, if you'd go ahead and you'd just jot that down. I know that he and Miss Donna, they want your prayer there. And uh, they, they, they're faithfully listening, faithfully listening to, uh, to our radio station and to, to this uh, live stream that we have. If you please be in prayer for them. And then Miss Violet Coker, she also has got surgery that uh, um, she's going to have to have soon on her, on her hip. And uh, I know that they would appreciate your prayers there. And then Bobby Robertson, um, you know, making the decision about what to do about this brain tumor. Should they operate? Should they not? It's a pretty big decision to make. I know they would appreciate that. And then uh, Mrs. Essinger's sister, Beverly Lee, uh, went home to be with the Lord, want to make sure we pray for them. And then Eddie Yancey just sent a note right before service that his uncle had also passed away. So if you'd be, please be in prayer for them. And then I was looking on our shut-in list, Mr. Al and uh, the, the Brown family and the Lauer family and the Waters family, husband and wife both shut in. And uh, I know that we need to keep them in mind, pray for them. I know they'd love to have you come by their home. But if you look, I'm sorry, I said Genesis 9. Look at Genesis 7 is what I need you to look at. Genesis chapter 7. And um, <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 7, you have mention of Noah's wife. And the Bible says, speaking about Noah and his family, verse number 7, Noah went in and his, his sons and his wife and his son wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And, um, you know, the, uh, the truth is you really never hear very much spoken about a pastor's wife unless there's a major problem. What I mean by that is this. If a pastor's wife is in adultery or if her husband is in adultery, fornication, then, you know, her name sometimes comes up. But usually they're just kind of in the background. And... Um, I think such is the case has been uh, probably with this church in its existence. Um, the, the pastor's wife never has been looked at as an associate pastor. I've never been one to run things. And, um, and you know, Pastor Appreciation this month has been a blessing. So many cards and things. We have, and I just thank you for that, um, especially not knowing me but for about 11 months. Um, but... Um, you know, one of the things about a, a pastor's wife, some of the things that are maybe a little difficult for them, um, and, and one of them is isolation. I just want to kind of, I want to say a few things tonight. My wife, she's probably already excused herself. There she, no, she's over there. If you want to go ahead and excuse yourself, you, you can do that. And I'm just kidding. You stay right there. Stay right there. Um, you know, isolation. And what I mean by that is this. Think about Noah's wife, if you would, for a minute. Has no, there's nobody else that's building an ark. Just Noah. There's nobody else that has a wife that is going through what Noah's wife is going through. She's isolated. And I've talked to enough pastors' wives and missionaries' wives, particularly missionaries' wives, some evangelists' wives. Um, I've, been in, I've been in hearing when they talk about how lonely it is, how hard it is on the mission field by themselves because they have to teach their children. They're, they're the school teacher. Um, they're the, uh, usually they're the musician of the church or they are tending to the children's ministry of the church on top of keeping a home and trying to be a wife in a culture that is very different from theirs. And so that causes a problem for them. There's really nobody they can talk to. If you think about Noah's wife, who would Noah's wife, who would she talk to about what was going on in her family, what was going on in her mind about what her husband was doing? Really, who would she talk to about that? Now, Noah could say, look, God called me, told me to build this ark. I'm going to build this ark. And he's out there and he's working and working. He's doing the work. She has to kind of sit on the sideline, you know, and, and uh, there's not really a whole lot of folks she can talk to about it. That makes it very hard sometimes for a, for a pastor's wife, for a missionary's wife. 
because of the isolation. There's things that they may know that they can't talk about. There's things they may sense that they can't talk about. And that's a second hardship, I think, on a, on a pastor's wife, and that is the expectation of a pastor's wife. Everybody expects a pastor. Of course, you know, if I came in, um, if I came in dragging the floor and, you know, I, I talked about how hard my day was and, boy, I just talked about how ill of a mood I was in, you know, I, most of you would say, well, you're not supposed to be that way, Pastor. You're supposed to come to the pulpit, you know, ready to go ahead and stand there no matter what kind of day you had. Well, pastor's wife, you know, they're expected to always, you know, be cheerful, be kind, even to people that have been ugly to their husband publicly. They're expected to raise perfect children. They're expected to keep a perfect house. They're expected to look like a million bucks everywhere they go. No chip clip in the hair. And I'm just saying that the expectation, and you know, honestly, isn't this true? No matter how well you train your children, don't your children still get a choice to choose Jesus Christ or not? You know, a lot of people think, well, you know, pastor's children, they ought to be doing right. And, and uh, they should be. I agree with you. So, so should the missionary's children. But the bottom line is the expectation sometimes is really high. A, a pastor's wife is probably expected to practice more than her husband preaches. She's supposed to be kind to everybody. She's supposed to have it, supposed to have it down. And really, the truth of the matter is, a pastor's wife is just like anybody else's wife, a missionary's wife. She's just a woman. Now, she may be a woman of God, but she's a woman. That puts a lot of pressure on them. Noah's wife. You think about the expectation of her. Um, think about the money. I don't know how much. I, I tried to figure this out. How much money would it have cost to build that ark? I know God sent the animals in by twos, but if you had to cut down all that timber, certainly Noah and his sons could not have been engaged in the business that they normally were doing. They, they quit that. They just started building the ark. So what did that mean? She had to work on probably, she had to put... I mean, she was probably scrimping and scrounging, doing what she could to, to keep them fed and, to, and, and those kinds of things because the money just wasn't there. A lot of missionaries, I mean, they are on the edge financially all the time. I mean, it's just a, it is one major accident away from having to leave the field. And that pressure is on that woman. And then the last thing is opposition. And, and honestly, I, I think that uh, there's great opposition, I think, against uh, uh, I think against a Bible-believing pastor, I think a, a, the devil hates those kinds of men. But if he can't get to those men, then I think he's going to work at trying to get to that wife. And, you know, hence we read about Job's wife. Now, I know there are a lot of people that say, well, Job's wife, just how, you know, how terrible a wife. But you know, I, I think after she saw her husband lose everything, saw him lose his health, I don't think that Job being a just man that eschewed evil, that raised the kind of children that he raised, I think that lady had to be a good lady, but under the condition. And come on, isn't it, isn't it true? Everybody's an expert until they get into the position that somebody else is living in. Everybody knows how they would act and what they would do and how they would respond. But you know, the truth of the matter is, if you had all your children in the grave and their homes were gone and all your finances were gone and your husband is covered from head to toe in boils, and... You know, whatever she said, she said, but the opposition, I think the devil opposes that pastor's wife, that missionary's wife, because he knows if she quits or if he can break her down, then that pastor's done. Same thing's true of those children. I, some of the best men that I know, when one of their children went wrong, they questioned whether or not they ought to continue in the ministry because they looked at themselves as a failure. So what I'm saying is tonight is this. I'm saying, you know, for Noah to have done what he did, he built that ark, his wife got inside, those three boys got inside, their wives got inside. I just think that, uh, I think that Mrs. Noah must have been some more kind of lady. All the mocking that Noah endured, so did she. You crazy woman, you married a nut. He's building a boat on dry ground. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad God gave me my nut. What do you have? I'm just saying, I think she was an unusual woman. I don't think she wavered in front of her children. All three boys got on that ark. Amen. That's in a day when every, every, every imagination was on the evil continuum. And with that in mind, I got to look at our prayer list tonight. And, and I just want to go through and list some of the ladies that we have in our church that are sick 
that, that are, are in the ministry or married to ministers, rather, Donna Edens. And Donna, Donna, if you just note her down there, I mean, and Carolyn Howard. I don't know if Carolyn's here tonight or not. She told me she didn't know she'd make it tonight. She's really, she's really struggling right now. Um, Willie Mae Johnson. Willie Mae, I don't, Willie Mae, what, where were you on the mission field, Willie Mae? In the Bahamas, and then Carolyn Howard, they were in Africa, the Edens in Africa. Uh, Donna Robertson, Donna, Donna's, um, her husband's been involved full-time, she's pastored many years. Naomi Kelly, and I think I'm right about this. Naomi, wasn't that Billy Kelly's wife? Is that right, or am I wrong about that? That's, that's, I say again? Okay, so then that's, that's what you get for being a new pastor not knowing, all right? Sharon Garrett, I know Sharon Garrett's her husband. Think about that, that church next door to us for over a year, probably a year and three or four months now without a pastor. And she's been right there in the middle of it. Um, Becky Wardlaw, Becky, Becky's, she, she's been involved in missions. She's sitting right back there. Nancy Rose, all the way down at the bottom of the page. And there may be others. Is there anybody that I've left off that list that somebody wants to raise your hand and point out to me? And then I got to think about this. How many, how many women in this auditorium tonight are married to a missionary, to a preacher, to an evangelist. Would you stand to your feet just a minute? How many do we have those in here tonight? Tisa, Miss Marcy, Miss Ann, Miss Dolores. Miss Dolores, you don't have to get up. You stay right. You don't have to get up. Miss Dolores has such a great smile. My wife. You, you, got, you got ladies that are here that, that are married to a minister. All right, so you think about the pressure that they're under. And, and, and how that goes. And, and what I'd like to do, <clears throat> I'd like to do if I could do this. Uh, BJ, you grab this mic right here. Ladies, you can sit down. We appreciate you. I just want people to look at you just a minute. BJ, if you take this mic right here. And uh, Brother Dan, you come get this one. And, and you know what I'd like to do on this side, that side, both you guys just kind of go down that middle aisle right there. And if there's a lady you'd like to call out tonight, all right, if there's a lady you'd like to call out tonight, as, as those men start to move up and we're not going to, Stand up and do this. They're just going to move through that aisle. You stop them if you want to stop them have, and call out somebody's name. Y'all walking too fast already. All right, back up a little bit, BJ. All right, if there's a lady, a pastor's wife, a missionary's wife, somebody, you like, just call their name out tonight. All right, I'm going to let you do that. So anybody, you stand up and they'll give you that microphone. Anybody, and they're just going to keep walking back. And if nobody stands up, then, I, then we're just going to keep on moving through. If you'd like somebody, you'd like a pastor's wife or a missionary's wife, you'd like to call out. Miss Sandy. Shirley Starr in evangelism. Her husband. Miss Starr, yes, ma'am. All right, just keep on going. All right, and stand up. Yes, stand up, son. Thank you. My mom, Abby Logan. Okay, well, she already stood up. That's good, though. I appreciate that. All right, anybody else? Somebody's not here. Somebody's not here. You want to call their name out? Got an opportunity. Got an opportunity. All right, Miss Style, she stood up as you passed already there, Dan. All right, anybody else? Just a lady. Just a lady. Oh, I know who Tisha's going to call out. Miss Style. Who? Say again. Oh, Miss, okay, okay, down in St. Lucia, is that right? Mon, Miss Monchery, okay. Tisa? Mrs. Howard. Mrs. Howard, okay, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. How about Mrs., uh, how about Mrs. Thompson? We can put her on that one, too. Anybody, just anybody, let you have that opportunity. If I were the devil, I, I would knock every pastor's wife out that I could. Brother Richardson? Uh, sometimes the uh, wives of Christian school teachers uh, make a lot of sacrifices to keep That's their right. husband uh, their spouse teaching, and that is definitely, I think, a, a missionary ministry to children. Amen. And so I really appreciate my wife and her investment in our ministry together for, uh, uh, well, we're pushing 50 years. Amen. Ministry, ministry 50 years or marriage 50 years? Marriage 50 years next fall. Amen. 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 Amen, Brother Richard. Good to have your daughter here tonight. Anybody else? Going to move through. Shirley Hughes. Miss Shirley Hughes got a letter for her today. Yep. We'll pray for Miss Shirley battling cancer. Yes, ma'am. Miss Kathy Sandy, Amen. ministering to the kids that don't have nobody. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Missionary to the kids that don't have anybody. How about that? That's great. Yes, ma'am. Linda Jordan. Um, she was a missionary from Italy. They're up in TR now or somewhere. <laughs> They're here in Greenville. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Eddie. Tammy Tooley. She's a missionary to England. Um, they're home on deputation and her father passed away unexpectedly. Amen. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Miss Angie. Martha Lance. Say that one more time. Martha Lance. Martha Lance. Uh, 
she's the widow of Bud Lance that graduated from the Bible College. Here. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Martha Lance. All right. Yes, sir. Brother Parker. Brother Parker, go ahead. Brother David. Oh, I'm sorry, Brother Skelton. I'm sorry. Can't see about that far back. <laughs> sorry. That that's all right. Dot Kelly, uh, wife of Billy Kelly. Yeah. Dot she, Kelly. She needs your prayers. Yes, ma'am. She's she a wonderful sure, yes, lady. Sir, she sure does. Anybody else? Yeah. Um. She, she, she's she's with the Lord now, but. My mother, Elizabeth Krieger, she was a, a, a pastor's wife and also my father also taught Christian school with my father. So she, she, she fell in both cat, two categories there. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Brother Krieger. Yes, ma'am. Miss White? Mary McBriar. Mary McBriar. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mary definitely needs our prayer, that's for sure. All right. If we could do this, Brother, Brother Aiken. Could I ask you and your wife to come to the platform together and you just pray over all these pastors' wives? Would you do that, Miss Marcy? Could we do that? Oh, Miss Marcy, faithful pastor's wife right here for many years. And um, to stand behind her husband, with her husband. Um, can't, can't do the ministry without it. And uh, I know Dr. Aiken, I know y'all. Y'all have a great relationship. So if you would, if you just pray for all these. And would you join as well? You know, maybe you didn't call somebody out, but maybe you'd pray for some of these ladies. You got a list right there. If you look at it, you got a list right there. Call some of them by name. Ask God to help them. I believe God does. Ask God to help them. Prayer time's a, a genuine time of help. So Dr. Aiken, you and Miss, Miss Marcy, y'all go right ahead. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful tonight that we have an open door and an invitation to come into your presence to pray. And we've failed many times to pray as we ought, and maybe as often as we ought. But we thank you for this opportunity tonight. And we do pray for these wives, and especially these pastors' wives, missionaries' wives that are serving alongside their husbands. I pray for my wife. Thank you for Marcy and for her faithfulness over the years. Uh, to go as I've gone and to uh, help me and to hold up my arms and hands. And I pray that you'll bless her and encourage her uh, in her life and as we get toward the sunset years of life and uh, changes take place and transitions take place. I pray you'll give her grace to be able to continue on. Thank you for our pastor's wife and her faithfulness to be at his side and hold up his arms and hands and to be there to help and to, to care for him. And I pray you'll just strengthen uh, Mrs. Logan and help her, we pray. Bless her as she is involved in raising the children and rearing the children. And just use her, Lord, we pray, as a blessing to her husband and to her family and to this congregation of people. Then for these uh, number of wives that are present tonight who are pastors, missionaries, and preachers' wives, bless them, we pray, and use them in the work of the ministry alongside their husbands to reach many with the gospel of Christ. Help us be faithful to be a witness for thee. And then some, Lord, who are not present with us have been noted tonight, and you have uh, this congregation has remembered them and called their names. And I pray, Lord, for them tonight. Some of them are elderly now. Some of them, some of them, their health is broken. They're not able to attend the services. They're not able to be in the ministry full time. They're not able to go as they one time did. Lord, that can be discouraging. And I pray that you'll just lift them up and encourage and help them. Some of them, Lord, their husbands have gone on to be with the Lord, be with you. And, and uh, Lord, they're alone now as far as uh, their partner. And I pray you just minister grace to them and help and strength and just lift them up and encourage them in this time. And Lord, I pray for your blessings upon them that you'll supply every need they may have, whatever it may be, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and financially, that you'll meet every need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And Lord, in their latter years, I pray, Lord, they'll just lean upon you and cast themselves and their care upon you, for they know that you care for them. 
And we bless you tonight and thank you for what you're going to do on behalf of these wives. We give you all the praise and glory and honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Before y'all step down, Dr. Aiken, could Mrs. Marsha give her testimony of salvation? Sure. Would you do that? Oh, you sure. You go right ahead. <laughs> um, my biggest battles have been spiritual battles. My biggest victories have been spiritual victories. And that's what affected every area of my life. Now, some people don't have a battle. I mean, they just say, Jesus saved me, and, and they have no problem with assurance of salvation. It wasn't like that with me. I, was, I told him I cried when I talked. Um, but I grew up in a Christian family. I knew what the Bible taught, and I did all the things they told me to do. But I did not have assurance of salvation. And somebody that's listening may be battling with assurance of salvation. When I was um, 50, about 15, 16, we had youth meetings um, on Sunday afternoon. We stayed here all day long. We would come in the morning, have church service, all the young people to eat lunch together. We'd come back and and um, meet in the chapel for a youth meeting. We'd stay for choir practice. We were here all day. And um, one Sunday, I was thinking about this. I did not have the assurance. I had done everything I was told. I just did not have the assurance. And um, I went up in that balcony and I laid on the pew because I wanted to be alone with the Lord. And I said, Lord, maybe some people can know they're saved and maybe some people can't. And maybe I'm one of those who can't. But if I just want you to know something, Lord. I'm going to trust you no matter what you do for me. And if you never do anything for me, I'm still trusting you. And, and, and it was like the Lord does speak to you. And it was like he said, what do you think you can add to what I do? What do you think you can do that could add to what I've already done? And the illustration came to my mind and I had not heard it before. I have heard it since. When somebody's learning to float and you tell them that water will hold them up, they'll just get so far and then they'll start fighting because they really don't think the water will, but it will. And that Sunday, it was as though the Lord said, why don't you just put all your weight on me? I can hold you up. And he can. And he has. And I, so I, I haven't had any problem with the assurance of salvation since that day. I know I'm saved. Now, there's been times as we grow spiritually, we start going back trying to do it on our own, and then he has to remind us. The same way you got saved, by totally, totally trusting in me. Quit fighting the battle. You're not God. I am. We rest on him again, and the sweetest peace comes into our life. And I've experienced that. There was a time after that that I fought a battle, and I thought, Lord, I don't care. I, I just want to know you, and I don't care if you ever make me happy. I don't care if you ever give me anything. I don't care what you do in my life. I just want to know you. And guess what? I got to know him really good. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's good. That's really good. Thank you, Miss Aiken. I know that sometimes people feel like, well, I just can't say anything. But, you know, if you say something, you might be a real help to somebody else. 
that's really struggling with something. And boy, I know this. I, how many of you found that Jesus Christ has got more than enough ability to hold you up? Isn't that the truth now? Well, what a truth that is. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Good tell. Okay, Terrell, talk to us a little bit about that mission. Amen. Thank you so much, Miss Aiken. My dad has always said, behind a great man of God, there's a great lady. And I really appreciate the ladies that have stood behind their husbands, and I appreciate my wife. Tonight we've got uh, five missionaries we're praying for, Brother Dave and Kathy from Canada. And here they, are, they're, they said that they're so thrilled that officially they have announced that the work on Thompson, Manitoba, Canada, has been turned over to a national pastor, a full-time pastor, and they're praising the Lord for that. And after that, they have gone to a work which is struggling in Kenora, Ontario, that has no pastor. And so you pray for them. Uh, they're asking prayer, and also they're asking for their health because their health is not doing so good. Uh, so pray for Brother Dave and Kathy Cook in Canada. Also, uh, Jim and Dolores Aguilar, uh, U.S. military. Uh, and they mention here, pray for our military, especially the ones coming out of combat. And he mentioned here something here that is so sad. And he said this, they say 22 soldiers commit suicide each day. Now that is sad. We really need to pr pray for our soldiers that God would uh, first save them and give them strength. And he said also pray about the situation in North Korea and Red China because the military are very concerned about that situation. So pray for these missionaries, Jim and Dolores Aguilar, as they're working with the military. Also, Carlos and Suzanne in Venezuela, uh, he mentions here, and what a blessing, that they had 571 children in vacation Bible school. Can you imagine that? And what a blessing uh, that is. And let's pray for this missionaries as they, uh, they in this uh, phrase that tells how they uh, had several vacation Bible schools and many children uh, in these Bible uh, vacation Bible schools. Also, uh, Christian and Am Emma in Ghana, and I'm just going to mention here it says 75 souls have been saved thus far from church services and the two school ministries. Can you imagine that? And, and all of that is part of our ministry because we give to missions. Uh, missionaries in Ghana are seeing people saved. And what a blessing it is to be able to give to missions. 75 uh, souls saved. And then it asks, uh, at the end it says, pray for us as we advance in the ministry God has prepared them for. And also, lastly, uh, Dean and Karen, uh, Karen uh, Assistant Director for Macedonia World Baptist Mission, uh, it says that this year marks Macedonia's 50th year of existence. 131 families that the Lord has sent their way through Macedonia uh, World Baptist Missions. And it says this, we pray that he will continue to have his hand on the mission and use it in a mighty way. And we're so grateful. I know several missionaries from Macedonia World Baptist Mission that worked with us in Brazil, and what a blessing they are. And so these are our missionaries uh, that we should pray tonight for them and many a prayer request, and many blessings of souls being saved. Thank you. Terrell, boy, I feel like I need a bail up here.
Have you, you ever seen them open and close the, the, Wall Street, the Wall Street index there? You ever seen them do that? Closing bell, ding, 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 ding. Well, they hit that hammer, and man, if it's gone up 2,300, they're all, woo, they're clapping, they're clapping. Man, you just read a, this isn't a Wall Street index, but this is an index of what's going on in heaven. I think we all be excited about that. Come on, if you invest in missions, 571 children in VBS, praise God. 75 souls, and they said they had some people that walked, 45 people walked over an hour to get to the town and hold VBS. I say, hallelujah, ding, 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 woo, glory to God, amen. Glad I got a part in that, amen. You say, well, how can you get excited about the stock market? No. No, I don't. I don't have stock. Why would I get excited about the stock market? Now, some of you have stock. I don't care if it crashes. You say, you shouldn't talk like that. Crashed before. <laughs> My dad has stock. If he's listening tonight, hey, I don't want to see it crash. I'm just saying. But you know what? You can't crash this one. You know, the Bible says that thieves can't break through and steal what you've laid up there right there. Isn't that a good thing? Everybody talking about, boy, stock market's 23,000. Is it going to go higher? I don't know, but this right here is going higher. Just trying to help you a little bit. Give you a little good news, something to rejoice over. Amen. 571 children, VBS. No. Oh, that's your retirement report you're reading there. You ought to be excited about that. Amen. <laughs> And I feel like I've left something out I'm supposed to be doing. Why are y'all still back there? Are we supposed to be doing something else? All right. Um, chapter 9. I'm, I don't want you to leave. I just, <laughs> Acts chapter 9. Turn to Acts chapter 9 if you would. Boy, I've got, I've got one of those messages. I've got pages of notes that are compressed into one page with like 100 cross-references which means that there is no way to get that preached in this short amount of time. But I do want you to go there for just a moment. Acts chapter 9, we saw Paul's conversion in Acts 9. Remarkable thing. An enemy of God breathing out threatenings and slaughter, trying to find Christians that he can put into prison. The guy gets born again. And you can be converted. God, God converted Paul. Then we looked at Paul's comforter in a man by the name of Ananias how that Ananias came alongside Paul and he healed him. God used him to heal him. And he put his hands on him. He identified with him. He really helped Paul. He was that first person that came to Paul and uh, he helped him. Now, tonight, tonight I want to look at, for just a minute, Paul's character, his character. Uh, you know, Paul wrote 13 books of the Bible. God used him to do that. God used him to start churches all over Asia Minor and other places. And Paul was an influential man. We still read the letters that God used to write through him. And sometimes, if you're not careful, I've heard people say this, boy, Paul was a smart man. And he was. I think Paul was intelligent. But I don't think Paul's intelligence is the reason that God greatly used him. Paul also spoke, he spoke five languages, and that's very impressive. I've heard he spoke five, maybe more, but I, I think that, look, I think that he was very versed in language, and, and, and he, had, he was a Roman citizen, but he was also a Jew, something unusual. So he was very unusually fitted, but I don't think that's the reason that God really used him. I think his character right here in chapter 9 kind of just jumps off the page at me, and maybe it would help us to see Hey, look, I could have that in my life. Maybe you couldn't learn five languages, all right? Maybe I can't do that. All right, maybe, I'm, maybe, I'm not, maybe I'm not intelligent enough to be in that sphere of thinking, but there's some things I can do. And if you look with me, um, chapter 9 and verse number um, 8, the Bible says, And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So he's blind. And the people leading him are the people that traveled with him to find Christians to kill. All right? Verse 7, look at it. And the men which journeyed with him. So the men journeying with Paul are the same men that lead him by the hand. All right? He can't see. He's blind. 
And, and they say, Paul, give us your hand. We'll take you into the city. Where are we going? So we're going to one, uh, going to a house by the name of Judas. That's where we're going. So he, he put his hand in their hand, and he's trusting them. And here's, here's one thing I'd like to say. I'd like you to write this down. He had a confidence in people. All right? I believe Paul had a confidence in people. Now, he did not have confidence in the flesh. He wrote in, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3 to have no confidence in the flesh. It's one thing to have confidence in the flesh, but it's another thing to have confidence in people. And I can hear somebody say, you shouldn't have confidence in people. In fact, most, most, uh, most commentaries, most, most people are going to tell you, you better not trust people. People are going to let you down. But I think Paul was trusting. You think about that for a minute. He can't see. All right, he just met Christ on the road to Damascus. He's called him Lord, and he says, what wilt thou have me to do? Those men probably are sitting there listening. He's putting his hands into somebody's hands that were looking for Christians. And he said, I want you to take me to this house. So he's really, he's being very trusting there. He's got a lot of confidence in these men that they're going to do good to him, not evil. And I think that's, I think that's something that, that is unusual about Paul. I think it, I think it takes and, and has a, a shadow that it cast on his whole ministry. In fact, go if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Put a mark right there. I just want you to see that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, it is true that it says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men or to put confidence in princes. And it is better to trust in the Lord, but you can have confidence in people. You say you can't have confidence in this world in people. Well, Paul, Paul didn't look at everybody through a stained glass. Paul had a confidence in people that I think is probably needful. All right. Out of all the churches in the Bible, the letters that we have, if you were to take and put at the top of the list, all right, this church seems like it was doing the best, I would probably put Ephesus there. Because of what's said about them in the book of Revelation, I would put Ephesus at the top. And then if you were to run through that list, the churches of Galatia, Philippi, Colossae, if you kept running that list, probably one of the churches I would put at the bottom would be Corinth. All right, I can read about all of Corinth's problems in 1 Corinthians. And yet look what the Bible says in verse 16 of chapter 7. Paul says this. I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. Now you see what he just wrote right there to a carnal church? He wrote to a carnal church that I have confidence in you in all things. And in my mind, you mean you've got confidence in a people that would allow incest? You've got confidence in people that drank at the Lord's table. You've got confidence in people that spoke in an unknown tongue and their women being involved. You have confidence in that kind of people. And Paul, unless he's lying, he writes, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. There's something inside of them I think he's putting confidence in. Look at it again at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Turn there just a minute. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Thessalonians are a good church, but they're awfully shaken by what they hear from other people. And um, 2 Thessalonians 3, look what the Bible says in verse number 4. Okay, This is Paul writing to a group of believers. He says these words, And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. We have confidence in the Lord touching you. In other words, I've got confidence in you because the Lord lives in you. I've got a confidence in you. Now look at it one other time and I'll fit. Look at Philemon. Philemon, the very first chapter of Philemon. He had a confidence in people. Philemon. All right, look down at verse number 21. He says, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Now remember, he's writing to a man that owned a servant who had left him and had the right to kill him if he wanted to. Paul writes the letter, Philemon. All right, and he asked him to do something. But I want you to look at verse 5 particularly. Because if you don't see this, I think you might walk out saying, I don't think we have to have confidence in people. I think Paul did. I think Paul had confidence in people. Look at verse number five. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus, and toward, can you say the next two words for me? 
All right, try it one more time. Verse number five. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus. Okay, I've got love toward Jesus and I have faith in Jesus. But then he says, thy love and faith and toward all saints. That he had a confidence in them. Now here's what happens in a church. We have people that we don't trust or we have folks in the world that we don't trust because we've been taken in by someone and and if you're not careful, then that jades the way you look at people. Everybody's a crook. Everybody has a bad motive. Everybody has a self-aggrandizing agenda. Everybody's a liar. Everybody, everybody has a cold heart. But I don't think Paul operated that way. I don't think Paul had a confidence in people. He had a confidence in them, though they had a flesh that was wrong he had a confidence in people, and I'm just guessing, maybe the reason he did that is because God was able to change him in such a way. Look, if God could change Paul, don't you think he could change anybody else? Amen? Amen. So he has a confidence in people. Now, I'm going to tell you, you ought to put some confidence in the people you go to church with. <laughs> I have met some people, honestly. They have this, uh, <laughs> they have this sarcastic eye that they cast towards everyone. And you meet them. How, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Alabama. Really, what part? North Alabama? Where'd you go to church? Well, I went to Moulton Heights Baptist Church. How long did you go there? <laughs> Who's the pastor? And, and it's like this, this idea they're... They're looking at people with these jaded glasses, expectant that they're going to do something that is wrong. Now, look, I know the flesh. There's no good thing in the flesh, but I believe you got to have confidence in people. In fact, we put deacons in the church um, there in Alabama. They didn't have deacons. I told them when I was coming that I believe deacons were in office, and it came time to do it. We had gone through weeks of studying the Bible about what the Bible teaches about deacons, and and we came to the place in time to do that. And I, I, I had three men that I wanted to put in. And, 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 and really, I knew that there was going to be a group of people that wanted this one man to get in who I knew was not fit and was going to cause problems. And if I had to confront him, it was going to be horrible. And so I just called my dad up and I said, Dad, tonight's the night they're going to nominate deacons. And he said, it is. I said, yes, sir. I'm nervous. I'm scared to death. And I really, I tell you what I'm thinking, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get up and I'm going to tell them who they need to nominate. He said, son, he said, you need to have more confidence in God's people than that. I said, but dad, if they nominate the wrong guy, it's going to be bad. This is the first time deacons have been in this church. I am going to just, I'm just going to encourage them in who they ought to nominate. Could I do that? No, son, you need to have confidence in those people. They're his people. I said, okay. So I didn't do anything. And then, you know, they filled out their nominations and I ran back to my office and slammed the door and. You know, got out the bottle of Rolaids and everything else. Started going through one, one, counting it up. Oh, here we go. No, there's another one. Oh, there's another. And you know, you know what the church did? The church put in the three men that I wanted them to put in that I thought were most fit. And you know what that taught me? You can't have some confidence in people. No, you can't trust people. If you have that attitude, you're going to have a hard time reaching the world. People know that. They're going to sense that. Paul, I think he had a confidence in people. That's why he went from town to town to town. Think about the places he went, the houses, the jails, the people he was in with the rooms, the people. He had a different attitude about him. And we can't, look, somebody may be from the north, but just because you're from the south doesn't mean you need to look at them strange. Are you really saved? Where'd you get saved? Ohio? <laughs> Were they using the King James Bible? got to be careful of that. Paul had a great attitude. He had a confidence in people. Go back to chapter 9. It doesn't look like y'all are buying on that one very much. That's okay. I'm just pointing out, just telling you, we're reading the Bible, what he had confidence in. He had confidence in some people that we wouldn't have confidence in, but he did. All right, chapter 9, <clears throat> verse number 11. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for... Behold, he prayeth. There's a second point of character of Paul. 
Paul was dependent on prayer. We find Paul here. Chapter 9, he's born again. The first thing we see him doing, verse 11, is he's praying. And the Lord tells Ananias, he says, behold, he prayeth. He's being characterized by that quality. And I'm not going to run these references tonight, but here's, here's how many times Paul said, listen, in fact, run one. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5. You need to see it. 1 Thessalonians 5. God uses Paul to write this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. All right? Great verse. 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul through the hand of the Holy Ghost, writes these words, verse 17, pray without what? Pray without ceasing. And you know, he tells the church at Rome that he's praying for them without ceasing, that they're always in his prayers. He tells it to the church of Ephesus, Romans 1, 9, Ephesians 1, 16, Philippians 1, 4, Colossians 1, 3, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, 2 Timothy 1, 3, and Philemon 4. And he says that to all these people. I'm praying with you for you without ceasing. I'm praying with you always. I'm always, you're always in my prayer. So what that tells me is that Paul really believes that. That's part of his character, that he is a person that is dependent on prayer. Now, if you're in 1 Thessalonians, just look how much he depends on prayer. Go back, if you would, to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Look at verse number 12. He talks about a man by the name of Epaphras. And I think Paul looked at prayer as something that got the job done. All right? Something that preceded the work. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, which is one of you. He's talking about the Colossians. A servant of Christ saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. In other words, Epaphras is praying for them, but he's laboring, it's work. And because of Epaphras' prayer, he's saying that God's gonna help you be perfect and complete, that you can stand, he's praying for them. All right, look, look, look how much emphasis again he puts on it. Go back, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter one. Just turn back to your left. We're on our way back to Acts. 2 Corinthians chapter one. And all I'm saying right now is Paul's character was this. Paul's character was he had confidence in people. And then Paul was dependent on prayer. 2 Corinthians 1, look at verse 11. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. All right, you're helping me by your prayer. We're laboring together. That's what Paul is saying. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. That for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks might be given on behalf, or, or, or might be given by many on our behalf. In other words, you're helping through your prayer. He's dependent on it. Look at it one more time. Romans chapter 15, just a few pages to your left there. Romans 15. Prayer is something that always came to the forefront in Paul's life. It's part of his character. It's for, well, you see him the first time. Romans chapter 15, look what the Bible says in verse number 30. All right. Romans 15, 30, now I beseech you, beseech, that's begging, that's pleading. I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He's begging, would you please help me? Now, we have missionaries come through on a regular basis and they'll hold up a prayer card and they'll say, would you please take this card? Would you please Pray for us. I'm going to say something tonight. I hear a lot of people sometimes talk about revival. There will never be revival if there's not prayer first. You are not going to see, you know why? Because revival does not come from a pastor or a church or a meeting. Revival comes from God. The Bible says, wilt thou not revive? I can't revive a church. I can't revive a congregation. Only God can do that. And the only way we'll ever see revival in this country again, it's not going to be if judgment falls. It's going to be if God's people fall on their knees and knock on the door of heaven saying, wilt thou not revive us again? Amen. Prayer has to precede that. And he's saying here, he's beseeching, he's begging. He's saying, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me. Paul was dependent on prayer, and he was a man of prayer. 
And I believe that makes sense. But we see that in Romans 9. We don't see that being stated in Colossians 4. We see it at the beginning. So in other words, it's part of his character. And if there's anything that I wish was true about my character is that I was a man of prayer like my grandfather. My granddaddy was a converted TVA foreman in his 40s, much like Brother DeWeese, a drinking man, a cursing man, a hardworking man. And when he got saved, he only lasted at Temple, uh, Tennessee Temple uh, one year, and they gave him a church, and he started pastoring. Then he went out planting churches. And everywhere Granddaddy went, he was known for being that man of prayer. Boy, Dr. Quiz, he'd get to pray. He'd get to pray and something would happen. And I'm saying, that's true, got to be true. The apostle Paul, you remember on the ship, when, when they think they're going to die, he's been down in the ship praying and he says, sirs, be of good cheer. The God whom I serve stood by me this night. I mean, he's talking to God. They're talking to each other. They're trying to figure out how to keep the ship afloat. You can't keep it afloat, but there's a God in heaven that knows how to be able to do that. He's talking to him. That's why I think he helped those churches. That's why he was able to persevere through all the trouble. He persevered through a lot of trouble. Go back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. He had a, he had a dependency on prayer. Mm. Ooh, I left out a verse that I meant to show you. Go back to Acts 9 about uh, his confidence in people. I know you're not supposed to go back and pick it up, but I can't help it. I've got to show you this verse. Look at verse 25. Then the disciples took him by night. And let him down by the wall in a basket. Whoo! You better have some confidence in somebody to climb in a basket with a rope tied to it saying, Sir, don't worry, we'll get you on the other side. <laughs> and your name is? And you don't know anybody there. <laughs> They're going to kill you, Paul. What do I do? Get in this basket. We'll let you down. <laughs> nope. Confidence in people. Dependency on prayer. Thirdly, verse number 19, verse 19. Maybe you appreciate this, maybe you won't. Verse 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. So he gets saved, he gets baptized, he gets strengthened. And now he says, I'm just going to spend some time with these guys here at Damascus. I told you, very well may be that the three years that Paul spent in Damascus are right here. Now, continue on though. Look, look now if you would at verse number 26. All right. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. So when he got to Jerusalem, look, at Damascus, he wants to be with the disciples. At Jerusalem, he wants to be with the disciples. Verse number 28, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Here's the third thing about his character. He had a preference for believers. He had a preference for believers. He wanted to be around believers. He got saved, so he wanted to be around the believers in Damascus. Okay, then he goes to Jerusalem. Now he wants to be around the disciples in Jerusalem. And he's going with them. The Bible says there in verse 28, and he was with them coming in and going out. He's just with them. He's right there. And here's what I would say to all of us tonight. Look, I, I really believe, I do believe with all my heart, he had a preference for believers. He wanted to be with them. Hebrews chapter 10 says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. This is Wednesday night. How many of you are here because you genuinely enjoy the people that you worship with? Could you say amen to that? This is my crowd. There are people that join other people on Tuesday night for happy hour. Downtown Greenville. At some really nice place. They got, they got all kind of fine furniture in there and they got a type of music playing in there and they're offering half price specials and boy they'll show up and see each other hey John good to see you man How, listen that's not my crowd my crowd is a group that says okay what are we preaching out of the Bible tonight okay what are we singing out of the hymn book tonight okay what can we do pray tonight this is my crowd right here amen Hallelujah. and that was Paul he loved being around the believers and I've said it before I'm going to say it again I've heard people say meanest people in the world are Christians I disagree with that. I think the best people in the world are born again Christians. Now, does that mean that we don't have a wolf or two? No. There, there, you'll find the mean one every now and then. I've been bit by a few. But this is my crowd. I like these kind of people. People say, no, those are strange people. That's my crowd. 
That's my crowd. They love Jesus. They get excited about the Bible. They want to sit inside, listen, they want to sit inside of a place and they want to hear somebody preach about a book that was written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago and then get excited about it. Yep, that's my crowd. Not interested in going down to Clemson University and having somebody tell me about how great Shakespeare's literary works are and what he meant on this stanza. And oh, look at the literary prose and beauty. Don't care about it, not interested in it. But you crack open that King James Bible right there. That's my crowd. It's my crowd. And that was Paul. He said, Look, where are the believers? You know, it's amazing. Some Christians go on vacation, and we, we're all good right now. So we're, we're far from June, July, and August. Some folks go on vacation, they don't go to church. Why in the world would you do that? If I go on vacation, I'm going to find where God's people are. In fact, I would love for people to show up in Greenville with this attitude. Hey, where are those crazy Jesus people that use that Bible that they say is right? Well, you're probably looking for that king. You, you, you're looking for that Tabernacle Baptist Church group down there. That's what you're looking for. Paul's looking for where the believers are. We got people say, oh, no. We're going to have an extended meeting? We're going to go through Thursday and Friday? You mean we've got to go to church Monday after Sunday and Tuesday and then Wednesday and then we've got to go on Thursday and Friday? I lose my Friday? That's not me. No, you say you got an extended I, I wouldn't mind having a two or three week meeting for that, that matter. I just know if I did, we wouldn't have but a handful of people show up. See what I mean? You didn't say amen to that. You have a three-week meeting? Man, we're going to go to church for three straight weeks. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do? Same thing we'd be doing in heaven. <laughs> it's my crowd. Listen, I came to church the other night and found Brother John Brown. He was here probably, I don't know what time John was here. He had to be here. I had to be 545. He was here early, early. Lights on. I'm wondering, what is he doing here? Danny. Danny Todd, he comes walking and he's here early. What is he doing here early? And I told both of them, I like to come to church too. In fact, I like just to hang around here. Sometimes I come and walk around, don't have anything else to do, just be around in the church because I like the church. I like pulpits. You know, you're not going to find one of these at the Peace Center, but you will find one inside of a Bible-believing church. I like pews. I like hymn books. I like what we have. You know, this is my crowd. I like getting around those Jesus people. And that's what Paul said. Paul used to be on the other side, but now that he got saved, <laughs> now that he got saved, he says, where's the next congregation I can go find? He's just doing what they did in Acts chapter 2. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. I like to eat with people that are saved. Some people only want to be with God's people on church day. I'll be here on Sunday preaching. I'll be here on Wednesday. But please, I mean, do we have to go out to eat? Do we have to have people over to our house? No, you don't have to, but you'd be better off if you did. They continued the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Give me the Bible. I want the Bible. I want the Bible. Good, get the Bible. And then go have some fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. I think you could have somebody over every night of the week if you wanted to, according to the Bible. The Bible says that they, they continued in the temple and break bread from house to house. How many of y'all eat every single day of the year? Almost, almost. Would you raise your hand? Just being with God's people? Boy, y'all quit buying this one too, didn't you? It's my crowd. It's my crowd. Didn't used to be my crowd, but it is now. His mind, and that's Paul. Paul had a preference for believers. If people get nervous going to be with believers, maybe there's something wrong with their character. 920, 920. I got It's already 830. 920. The Bible says, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue. Now, Paul had a passion for the truth. All right, what? Straightway. He preached Christ in the synagogue. That means immediately. He got right on it. Straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogue. All right? Verse number 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Verse 27. 
Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Verse 29, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. Now watch this, but they went about to slay him. It's, it's, it's unusual. Verse 29, the Greeks want to kill him. Verse number 23 and 24, the Jews want to kill him. You know why? Because he's boldly preaching the gospel. He's just, he's passionate about the truth. Now, listen, I know everybody's got a different personality, but, but Paul, Paul was passionate for the truth. He spake boldly. I like to hear bold preaching. I like to hear somebody that's got, con- listen, I am not preaching something I hope is true tonight. I know what I'm preaching is true because I'm preaching it out of the Bible. Amen. So I don't need to get up and apologize and say, well, it could mean this or it might mean this. No, tell you what it means. Paul preached Christ and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. He was passionate about the truth. Hey, hey, we ought to be more passionate about the truth than we are about the hobbies and about the, all the many sports and things in this world. You ought to be more passionate about Jesus. You ought to be more passionate about him than you are um, Black Friday. I've heard of people standing in line all night to get into a place to buy some little thing that's made in China. And I saved $200. Great, save the $200. Why can't you stand in line all night to get inside of a church building then? Why can't you spend a little money to go on a mission trip and tell people about Jesus? Come on, Eddie, get with me or quit, whichever one you want to do. Get passionate about the truth. Listen, I know that there's all kind of opinion on the television. There's all kind of opinion at Fox News and CNN and MSNBC and all that. Look, I'm passionate about the truth. It really doesn't matter to me what they say is true. I know I've got a strict measure for the truth. Amen. The Bible says, study to, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be the same. Rightly dividing the word of truth, that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, that I'm supposed to speak the truth. And hey, I think Paul did it without apology, and he said it boldly, and he ought to say it boldly because he's right. I've been accused before of somebody saying, you just think you're always right. That's not true. But you don't want me to get up and preach if I think I'm wrong, do you? Be passionate about the truth. I, you know, I don't know what these little things are you spin on your finger. All right, I'm, I know you know. I don't. All right. and, and I do have. I've got ADD, ADHD. I have all those other things. I've probably got them all. But I just, I don't get that. Look at my new spinner. It's blue. Wow. What does it do? You can get excited about that. And I'm not trying to make fun of the kids that have them. I just don't get it. I asked somebody, what else does it do? Well, it spins. <laughs> Woo. And again, I'll probably upset somebody. That's one reason I never have understood NASCAR. I don't, I don't understand watching cars go around the same circle over 200 laps. Well, you're just not a true race fan. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> I went one time, went to one race, and, and, and I told him it was boring. The guy that was winning was two laps ahead of everybody else. Well, everybody knows he's going to win. Two laps ahead? I said, I hope somebody wrecks. They got so mad at me. You hope somebody wrecks? Yeah, big sighting. You're just not a true race fan. You got it. I don't get it. I, I, really, I don't get it. I think in heaven, they look at us, get excited. And I do. I get excited about football. Can't help it. I get excited about hunting. Can't help it. I think they look over the portals of heaven sometimes. They look at us and we're just, we're just we're, we've lost our mind. Oh, this is great. And I think in heaven, they look at us. You know what they're doing? They're looking at us like people going, What about Jesus? What about glory? What, what about the truth? Yeah, 
Oh, that's just a boring book. You know, I used to believe that was a boring book until I got right with God. And then I started reading that book, and I found out there was something more Bible inside this book than you can get inside of a stadium. Amen. Paul's passionate about the truth, but lest I stop there, that truth is in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.21 says the truth is in Jesus. Now watch, verse 20. This marked his whole ministry. Verse 20. Straightway he preached, can you say the word for me? Christ. Verse 22, Saul increased the more and more in strength. So he's gaining strength, he's learning. And confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very who? Christ. Christ. Verse 27, the Bible says how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of what? Jesus. Verse number 29 and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord, what? You know, he said in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said, we preach Christ crucified. He said in Philippians chapter 3 that he counted all things but loss. Mrs. Aiken said it just a little earlier. I count all things but loss for the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. whom I have suffered the loss all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. What I'm saying is his character was such he was passionate about the truth particularly in Jesus Christ. He had a confidence in people. He also had a preference for believers and he had a dependency on prayer and if you were to take all those things out of chapter 9 and lift them out then Paul doesn't have the same ministry. But those things are found as he works his way on those missionary journeys and as he pins Ephesians and as he pins 1 Thessalonians and as he pins Colossians. They mark his ministry because it was his character that God used him to do such a great work. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Paul had character. I need it. I need that kind of character. And uh, I believe God wants to use us. All right. If you stand to your feet, appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, we'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Paul's character. Lord willing, Sunday we'll look at Paul's uh, champion. Not, not his uh, comforter, but his champion. I'm excited about that as well. How many plan to come? Let's see. How many of y'all plan to come Sunday night? Would you raise your hand? All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I have confidence in you. <laughs> Lord, we sure do thank you that we can look and see that a man can have what we could have. That we could have confidence in people. That we could be dependent on prayer. That we could be passionate about the truth. Lord, that we could be given to your, your family, partial to those believers. Lord, we could do the same thing. And maybe if we had the same character, then maybe, God, you could pick us up and you could maybe do more with us and we'd see more work get done. And I, I pray you'd help us. I pray you'd encourage your people. I pray you'd help us to see that you're a God that uses men. You use women. You, you, you use people to get the job done. That we're your hands and your eyes and your feet. And we need to be, we need to be fitted for the task, Lord. Help us, help us to be fitted, Lord. And we'll, we'll ask you to receive our thanks for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Tell somebody you love them on the way out now.